I'd like to start off this Easter Sunday the only way I know how. He is risen. And if you're watching this at home, I'm sure you know the only proper response to this. He is risen indeed. And he is alive and well, seated at the right hand of the Father and in complete control of the world, even when times are turbulent. Today, we remember that we serve a God who not only loves us enough to die for us, but a God who keeps his promises and has proven his power over death. We have true freedom in Christ through the shedding of blood, and we have hope for eternity through the resurrection. On Easter Sunday, we remember and we celebrate this. Let's join together today as we proclaim the resurrection with believers from all around the world.
You know, Jesus gave us a preview of his resurrecting power when he raised Lazarus to life, telling Martha only moments before, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Jesus then became the embodiment of this glory, rising from the dead himself, proving to the world once and for all that he is indeed the glorious one. are lifted high, our hearts are bowing in reverence, and we're surrounded by the glory of your presence with every creature, every time. who willingly went to the cross and it was our sins that took him there if we want proof of God's love for us then we must look first at the cross where God offered up his son as a sacrifice for our sins Calvary is the one objective absolute irrefutable proof of God's love for us I 
lost my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on the cursed tree His body bound and drenched in tears They laid him down in Joseph's tomb The entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all alone saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Messiah, the resurrection was no afterthought or epilogue. It was redemption's earthquake that shook the foundation of eternity. It was the defining event that marked the dawn of a new age. Now the end is near. We live in the era, era when our forgiveness is totally secured. His presence is forever enjoyed. And praise God, we are finally free. 
Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope with no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in And when death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains My orphan heart was given a name My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance When death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so free washes over me you have made me new now life begins with you it's your endless love pouring down on us you have made us new now life begins with From my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom, he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested and my life began, oh, your grace so free watches over. displayed on a criminal's cross and darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost but then Jesus arose with love Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been taken away from the entrance. She went running to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved. (laughs) 
They have taken the Lord from the tomb. And we don't know where they have put him. Then Peter and the other disciple went to the tomb. The two of them were running, but the other disciple ran faster than Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and saw the linen cloths, but he did not go in. Behind him came Simon Peter, and he went straight into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the cloth which had been around Jesus' head. It was not lying with the linen cloths, but was rolled up by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in. He saw and believed. They still did not understand the scripture, which said that he must rise from death. Then the disciples went back home. Mary stood crying outside the tomb. While she was still crying, she bent over and looked in the tomb. And saw two angels there, dressed in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been, one at the head, the other at the feet. Woman, why are you crying? They asked her. They have taken my Lord away. And I do not know where they have put him. Then she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Woman, why are you crying? Who was it that you were looking for? She thought he was the gardener. So she said to him, If you took him away, sir, tell me where you have put him, and I will go and get him. Mary. She turned toward him and said in Hebrew, Rabboni. This means teacher. Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet gone back up to the Father. But go to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to him who is my father and their father, my God and their God. So Mary Magdalene went and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and related to them what he had told her. No one saw it coming. Suddenly the whole world had been cast into deep, dark gloom. People hid in their homes, afraid to go outside, afraid of what would happen to them if they did go outside. Never had the followers of Jesus felt so afraid, so vulnerable, so fragile. Such a short time ago, all the world seemed well. People were living normal lives, rejoicing, laughing, socializing. People cheerfully greeted each other on the streets as they went to worship and all of life seemed well. In fact, Jesus had ridden into Jerusalem to the acclaim of the crowds who recognized that he was Messiah, the promised one of God, the son of David, the savior of the world, the focus of the Old Testament. They cried out to Jesus, Hosanna, Hosanna to the, to the king, Hosanna to King David. Save us. Save us now. But all the while, a secret plot was at work, and eventually even Judas would be drawn into this dastardly deed. Betrayal, a kiss, arrest, mock trials, scourging, scourging to within a breath of his life, Crucifixion, death, burial, burial without proper preparation. As Jesus hung on the cross, the sun grew dark in midday. Lightning and thunder cracked. The earth shook. 
even the temple of God had been damaged as the veil split from top to bottom and all the people throughout Jerusalem had heard of this event. Everyone was alarmed. What was going on? Why this darkness in the midst of the day? Fear ran rampant. Children cried. Mothers sheltered them. Men ushered their families into the safety of their homes for protection. The disciples hid and locked the door. The women who had been faithful to serve the Lord sheltered in place and waited, waited, waited for the Sabbath day to pass, waited for the first day of the week so they could continue their work at the tomb. In the unseen realm, much activity was taking place. Satan laughed, for he had won, so he thought. Death had won and hope was gone. While all Jerusalem feared and wondered and hid, Satan threw a party. It was a weekender. And the whole world of demons rejoiced. It was Friday. But then came the first day of the week. The gloom had not departed as the day began. The sorrow had not passed. The fear had not subsided. And the small band of Jesus' followers were not courageous. But a journey was about to begin. A journey to the light. I would like to take you on that journey this morning. There would be three stages on that first resurrection morning. Three stages to the journey that Sunday morning. I'd like to join me as we retrace the steps of that journey. The first stage would be despair in the dark. The day had begun at sundown the evening before, but of course everyone slept through the night but early in the morning. John tells us activities that took place even before the sun was up. John chapter 20 is filled with despair. And John sets the mood by reminding us in verse 1, it is still dark. I think there's a double meaning to that because I think it was dark outside, but I think it was dark, dark in the hearts and souls and minds of the disciples and the women and the followers of Jesus that day. I think it was still dark throughout all the world. Dark it was. And darkness is interesting in how it reveals itself. Because the very first thing that we see in verse 1 is that everyone is alone. It says John, John actually picks up the story with Mary and sorts Mary out as being alone. And even though there were several of the women that went to the tomb together, John traces the account from Mary Magdalene's perspective. I think that Mary probably prepared herself in her home as the other women did, and they had maybe planned to meet at a certain place along the pathway that led to the garden that morning. And so early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary went to the tomb alone. Alone she got up in the morning. Alone she prepared to face the day. Alone she opened the door. Alone she stepped out on the path that would lead to the tomb. Alone she was. I want you to know something. That life without a Lord is a lonely life. Life without God is a lonely life. Life And life without a Savior is a lonely life. As far as Mary knew that morning, her Lord and her Savior had died, was buried in the tomb, and was no more. So the day begins with Mary being quite alone, but it moves to her being alarmed. And in verse 1b, it says, Mary went to the tomb. And she saw that the tomb had been removed, that the, that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Is there no end to how miserable life can get? You know, we're in the middle of a pandemic in this world right now, here in 2020. And sometimes I wonder, is there no end to the misery? Every day, there's more news. 
And while there's little tiny bits of encouraging news, most of the news is miserable news. It's bad news. We're counting how many people have this sickness. We're counting how many people have died. And every day, the number jumps higher and higher. And sometimes I sit down in, in the morning in front of the, the, the news, and I wonder, is there no end to the misery? And for Mary and the others, I think that's what Mary thought. First of all, her, her Lord had died. Secondly, she's all alone. Thirdly, she goes to the garden and all of a sudden she's alarmed. The stone, the stone, it's gone. It's removed. The word in the Greek makes it seem to me that it wasn't just rolled out of place. You know, we see those pictures of the tomb and then that big stone rolled off to the side. That's not the way the Greek describes it in the New Testament. It looks to me like the stone was shattered, that it was broken into pieces. It was, it was blown up as it were. Why, why is it that alone so often leads to alarm and, and sounds and sights and smells and and imaginations run rampant in the midst of our loneliness and in the midst of our alarm. And there Mary approached the tomb and the stone was gone. It was gone. It was destroyed violently. Violently. Someone had come and done this thing to the tomb of her Lord. And so that led her to the third thing in her journey. And it was that she was alarmed um, excuse me, she was afraid. It says in verse 2, she came running to Peter and John and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they have taken him. An outpouring, folks, an outpouring of her soul in agony, crying. The word in the Greek is that she was wailing, wailing in agony, screaming in agony. She was nearly hysterical, if not hysterical, because of this awful, awful thing that she imagined had happened to her Lord, had happened to her Savior. Oh, how dark was the despair. Oh, how dark was the time. Afraid, agony agonized the disciples went back to their homes but mary stood outside crying oh how dark despair can be oh how heavy the darkness of soul and heart and mind and life when all around our soul gives way when we find ourselves alone and alarmed and afraid. Oftentimes there's nothing left but agony. Mary's dark despair was agonizing. We are living in a dark day today. Many people feel alone, afraid, alarmed, agonized. I don't have nearly as much contact physical contact, face-to-face -face contact with the body of believers here at Fellowship or others that I come in regular contact with. But when I do contact you through Facebook, email, instant messaging, I feel your heart and you feel mine. Texting one another back and forth. We've often expressed our sorrows to each other the darkness of the day in which we live. If we learn anything from the darkness of the resurrection morning, it's that life without Jesus is hopeless, folks. Life without Jesus is hopeless. Sometimes and oftentimes, too often of times, we find ourselves in the despair of the dark. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. I got to tell you, that verse represents my feelings and my thoughts this resurrection morning quite well. I'm excited. I'm excited about resurrection day. I'm excited about the truth of the word of God. The resurrection of Jesus who conquered death and gives life to all who believe. But, but I'm living in a time like you are, where it seems to me we're hard-pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. We are perplexed. Where did this come from? How do we deal with it? But we are not in despair. 
We are persecuted, but we are not abandoned. We are struck down, but we are not destroyed. And so Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica, and he said, we do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Much of the world grieves today, and much of the world has no hope because they have no Savior, because the God that they worship is dead. It's a God of wood, a God of stone, a God of their own making, a God of their own imagination, but not the one true God, not the real God, not Jehovah God. We do have hope, and we have a reason for our hope. And that reason for Mary and the others was about to be discovered. So yes, they found themselves in the darkness of despair, the despair of dark, But secondly, the second part of the journey, the second stop is the discovery of the dawn. Discovery of the dawn. Wow, all of a sudden the sun is beginning to just barely come up over the horizon. Time is moving on. Mary has made her way to the tomb. She's astounded. She's shocked. She's afraid. She's alarmed at what she has found. And so all of a sudden, all of a sudden, everything changes and we see an investigation that needs to take place because Mary runs back and tells Peter and John and the others exactly what she has seen. And so the Bible tells us, so Peter and John started for the tomb. Both were running. But John was faster because he was younger and reached the tomb first, but didn't go in because he was maybe more timid. And he bent down and he looked in, but he didn't enter and then Peter arrived and went into the tomb and saw the strips of burial linen lying there you see as Peter as as Peter um, and John ran to the tomb they had to go for a very specific reason sorry ladies but in ancient times women were not considered reliable witnesses in ancient times women were not witnesses in court They were not considered reliable witnesses for any purpose at all. As a matter of fact, I'll just refer you to Paul's list of witnesses in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 concerning the resurrection of Jesus. And Paul gives a whole list of witnesses, never mentions a woman among them. Not that the women didn't count to Paul. Not that the women didn't count to Jesus. Exactly opposite of that, okay? It just was a cultural thing where women were not considered reliable witnesses. And Peter and John, living in that culture, had to run to the tomb. I think they'd have ran anyway. I would have gone if my wife came in and said, hey, you're never going to believe what I just saw. And, and then tells me this astounding story that the dead have come back to life. I'm running to take a look at that. And so Peter and John ran, <clears throat> ran to the tomb. And what they saw as they investigated was impossible. That's what I love about Resurrection Sunday. We are celebrating the impossible. It says as Peter entered, he saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself separate from the other linen. Now, I need to explain this because unfortunately, the translations of our Bible do not do justice to the intent of the Greek and the report that John is giving us in his gospel here. John is announcing something very specific to his readers, and they understood him in his language of the day. We have moved 2,000 years away, and we have translations of translations of translations, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that have changed the meaning just a little bit. Now, they're not inaccurate, but they're not giving us the full color view that John had. And then we have paintings and drawings and art and movies and all kinds of things that are, that are depicting what, what people think John and Peter saw in the tomb that day. And it's not quite right, okay? What exactly did he see? Well, <clears throat> before I get to that, I want you to understand that he saw strips of cloth, It says strips of linen or strips of cloth in the Greek. And he saw strips of cloth lying there. What is that? Strips of cloth. Well, I want to make a tie together here. Strips of cloth and swaddling clothes at the birth of Jesus are essentially the same thing. 
When Jesus was born, Mary wrapped him in swaddling clothes, strips of fabric, strips of cloth. And at burial, the Jews wrapped a body and added herbs and spices to help with the preservation and the embalming process. Now, the Bible tells us that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus had participated in the preparation of Jesus' body, but they had not finished because they ran out of time. The Sabbath was beginning at sundown. Jesus was crucified at three in the afternoon, And so there was very little time to get him down off the cross to the tomb and prepare his body. Now, I think that on the morning, and I don't want to sound morbid here, but I think on the resurrection morning, they didn't know it was the resurrection morning, but when Mary came to the tomb and she with the other women to prepare the body of Jesus, they were expecting to see a gruesome thing. Now, Mary has not gone in the tomb, but Peter and John did. Peter first, and, and uh, then John takes a look. And I think that what they saw was, was strange to them. It was not what they expected. Certainly, they expected to see a body wrapped in the strips of cloth, beginning the deterioration process which meant the body would have been swelling and bloating and smelling. And what they saw was impossible. It was impossible. They saw that cloth was folded up by itself that was around his head. They saw the strips of linen that was around his body lying there by themselves. What exactly does that mean? Well, I want, to use, I want to use the word inconceivable. What they saw was inconceivable. Why? Why? Here's the amazing thing, folks. Here's the discovery that they made that morning. Why was it inconceivable? Because, it, because, because what they saw was the cloth as if it was wrapped around a body, the strips of cloth as if they were put on a body, Whenever, when the Bible uses, and in ancient times, when they prepared a body, it was referred to as, as uh, folding the linens around the body. We think of folding the linens as taking a sheet or a towel and folding it up and putting it in our, in our um, linen closet. That isn't what the word folded meant in ancient times when, when it concerned the preparation of a body. Folding is what you did around the body. I've recently had several casts on my uh, leg because of my ankle surgeries. And each time that they put the new cast on, they take um, um, fabric that is rolled up. Fiberglass, actually, is what it is. They wet it, and then they, and then they wrap it around my leg. In ancient times, that would have been referred to as rolling or folding it in place. They saw the, the cloth folded in its place as if it was wrapped around a body you know what they saw they saw the empty remains of the cloth folded around the body i often think of it as like an eggshell without the egg yolk and the white inside it had miraculously come out and all the cloth was still folded as if the body was inside but it was not They saw the empty remains of a body. The cloth was still in place, but it was empty. As a matter of fact, it tells us that the part that was around his head was separate because the part that went around the head was not a continuous part of the rest of the body. It was a separate piece, and so there it was separate, and they could see there's no body in there. And then when I look at verse 8, verse 8 says, Finally, John 2 went inside. He saw and believed. You see, he had to see something more than just a corpse that had been unwrapped and the linens folded up in the corner. Anybody could have done that. What John saw was impossible. What John saw was inconceivable. The body had escaped the linen without moving the linen. That's what John saw, and he saw, and he believed, but he still didn't understand it. 
He didn't understand that Jesus had to rise from the dead. And so that's our second stop on our journey this morning. But there's a third. We began with the despair of the dark. Then the discovery of the day. And now we come to the, excuse me, the discovery of the dawn. Now we come to the delight of the day. The delight of the day. The third stage is just beginning. And this is where it really gets good. Because this is what Resurrection Sunday is all about. We don't just have a Savior who bore our sins. We don't just have a Savior who took our sins upon himself, who, who knew no sin yet became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We don't just have a Savior that made payment to God. We have a Savior that then conquered death and came to life. We have a Savior that paid the penalty of our sins and provides life, life everlasting, life forever and ever and ever to those who believe in him. Those who believe in Jesus will not die. Our body will, but we will not. And one day we will step out of this body and receive a glorified body that is immortal, that is perfect, that is sinless, that is stainless, that is without sickness, without infirmities, without defect. That's what the delight of the day is going to teach us. And so I find this interesting. First of all, there's kind of a re-examination. The disciples go back to their homes, but Mary stands outside the tomb, and she's crying. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And probably in ancient times, uh, the tomb was a little bit different than the pictures that we see. We usually see a tomb hewn into the side of a rock. More than likely, this tomb was hewn down into the rock. And so it went down and not in. And so Mary stooped over and she looked down into where once there had been a stone, but the tomb was there. She bent over, she looked down and wept as she was doing that. And as she was doing that, she saw two angels where Jesus' body had once been lain. And so there's a kind of a re-examination. Mary, to her credit, is not going to just take the word of the men. Now, women were not reliable witnesses in ancient times, but I'm not convinced that women always thought men were reliable witnesses either. And so Mary looks into the tomb because she needs to see with her own eyes whether this is so. Mary had accompanied Peter and John back uh, I'm back from her, back when she went to tol- tell them, back to the tomb. And then Peter and John now return to their home. But Mary, Mary stays there and sees two angels, the re-examination. But then there's a review. And I love this because, because they, they ask, the, the angels are there. And they ask her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away. And I don't know where they have put him. Now, the angels knew why Mary was crying. They knew the answer to that. They're not asking for their information. They're asking Mary, now that she's re-examined the tomb, to re-examine her heart, her mind, her understanding. Why are you crying? And at this... She turned around, and she saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realize it was him. And Jesus looked at her to review this issue one more time. Woman, a term of affection in Jesus' day. Woman, why are you crying? And thinking that he was the gardener, she said, if you've taken him, tell me where you've taken him to. Why are you crying? Who are you looking for? 
And Jesus speaks one word to her. Jesus speaks her name. Jesus says, Maria, Maria, Mary, Mary. Oh, how the light did shine. Rabboni, Rabboni, my teacher. And the light began to shine as the sun began to rise in the sky. And Mary came to realize that what was in the tomb was real, even though it was impossible, unimaginable. What was in the tomb was so. Jesus was alive. Her master, her Lord, her Savior, her God was alive. He was not dead. He had defeated death. He had paid for sin, and he had defeated death, and he was alive. And Mary runs. She runs from that place back to the disciples, and she has a report to give to them. And her report's better than theirs. It's better than theirs. What did they report? Well, first of all, she reported that the, that the stone had been moved. They went, and they go back, and they report the body isn't there. Mary goes back, and she reports, I have seen the Lord. I have seen the Lord. Wow, a first-hand experience. She had seen Jesus. She had talked to Jesus. She had heard his voice. He had called her name. And she reached out to him with her voice saying, Rabboni. Rabboni. It is Resurrection Sunday. Ladies and gentlemen, it is Resurrection Day. And as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord, we stand different from every other faith in all of the world. Our Lord has conquered death. You see, the Bible tells us that when God created Adam and Eve... God gave them everything they could see with the exception of one single tree and the fruit thereof. They were not to eat of it. They were not to partake of it. It was not theirs. And they rebelled against God, and they listened to the voice of the devil. They took and they ate. They sinned, and they died. They became sinful, and they became mortal. Jesus came to undo the brokenness of the world. Jesus came to remove sin and to remove death for all who believe in him. What's the application of Resurrection Sunday to us today? Let me, there's all kinds, there's many. Let me give you some. Number one, without God, only darkness reigns in your life. If you are listening to me today, wherever you are, if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, if you are without God, without God, if you don't believe there is a God, or you believe in a God of your own making, or a false God, any God other than Yahweh God, I am God, then you are living in darkness. And darkness cannot save you. Darkness cannot deliver you. Darkness cannot protect you, and darkness cannot provide for you. So number one, I want you to understand, without God, only darkness reigns. And darkness reigns around the world today. Number two, without a Savior, all of life brings nothing but alarm and fear and agony. We're living in the midst of a pandemic. And people are panicky. They're afraid. They're uncertain. They're filled with fear. They're agonizing over all of this. I got to tell you that as a believer in Jesus Christ, the worst thing that can happen to me 
is my body dies and my soul, my spirit, and my glorified body live forever and ever and ever and ever in eternity in heaven with Jesus, with God, the Father, Jesus, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Do you have that confidence today? Do you know for sure that if you died today, that you're going to be allowed into heaven? Because you can know that. You can know that before this day is over. That's what Resurrection Sunday is all about. Confidence that my sins are forgiven and I've received new life through Jesus Christ. Number one, without God, darkness reigns. Number two, without a Savior, life is nothing but fear and alarm and agony. Number three, Without a risen Savior, all hope is gone. Without a risen Savior. You see, it's not just enough to have one that died in our place. I guess then we could die without sin if we believed in him and trusted him for that. But I want more than just to die and be gone. There are some religions that actually teach that. That when you are dead, you are dead and there is no more. Without a risen Savior, my hope of eternal life is gone. Without a risen Savior, our hope of life is gone, folks. Our Savior conquered death. Our Savior rose to life. Our Savior lives today. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. He's with me. He's here. He's with you. And he is our hope of everlasting life. And number four, our God is a God of the impossible. Our God is greater than death. Science will tell you that most of the things that are in the Bible can't be true because they're not possible. Science will tell you that God couldn't have created the earth in six days because that's impossible. Science is going to tell you that the sun couldn't stand still. That's impossible. Science is going to tell you that axe heads won't float because that's impossible. Science is going to tell you that the waters of the Red Sea and the waters of the Jordan at flood tide could not have been parted because that's impossible. And I'm going to tell you that my Bible, my Bible... God's holy word says that my God and your God is the God of the impossible. And what's impossible is for a dead man on the third day to rise to life, and God did the impossible. Jesus became sin for us, and then Jesus died, paid the penalty of of his blood, because God said, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins, rose from the dead, conquering not only our sinfulness, but conquering death as the result of our sinfulness and gives life to us. It's impossible. I want you to believe our God is the God of the impossible. He's greater than death. He is more powerful than Satan. Oh, yes, Satan thought he won at the crucifixion. As the blood dripped upon the ground... Satan laughed. But that wasn't the end. For on the third day, Jesus, our God, proved that he is greater than death, that he is more powerful than Satan, and our God overcomes our fears. Our God has died for us, was buried for us, rose again to give eternal life to all who believe in, believes in him. Our God does the impossible. He does the impossible. Let me leave you with this. Our lives are lived in a visible, tangible world. It's so important to understand that the visible, tangible world around us is surrounded by an invisible and spiritual world. Nothing happens in the visible, tangible world that is not being used for God and by God for spiritual purposes in your life and mine. If you're living in fear of the visible world today, you are missing the inconceivable greatness of God. If you are living in fear in the visible world, you are missing the power of our invisible God who one day will be visible to us and we will behold him then face to face. If you're living without Christ as your Savior, 
you should live in fear. If you're living without Christ as your Savior and without placing your trust in him for your salvation, you should be afraid because death is awful, awful for those who die apart from Christ. If you've set aside all that God has done for you, then you will stand before him in judgment one day and God will say, why have you rejected me? Will you trust him today? In the midst of a dark world of despair, will you trust him? Can you say, I believe, Jesus, that you died for my sins. I accept your free gift of salvation. And I accept your free gift of eternal life. Can you trust him to care for you in this life? In the midst of fear, agony, panic, sickness, death, dying all around us. Can you trust him to care for you? Our God does the impossible. Can you trust him to provide for you? The Bible says, once I was young, now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken. God takes care of his people. Can you trust him? The living Savior who does the impossible to provide for you? Can you trust him to protect you today? To protect you and to keep you in the shelter of his arms, huddled near him, close to him, within his love. Can you trust him to do the impossible? Will you trust him as your Savior and Lord, the one who died to make payment for your sins, as your faithful guide and shepherd through every distress of this life? Will you trust him to take your hand and lead you into his precious gift of eternal life for you. Like Mary, folks, he called her name Maria. Like Mary, he calls your name today. He calls your name. Will you come to him? Will you say yes to Jesus? Will you accept him as your Savior? From the words of Isaiah the prophet, God says to you today, Do not be afraid, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you go through deep waters and great trouble, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned. The flames will not consume you, for I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. And now, may the God of peace, who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you through the power of Jesus Christ all that is pleasing to him, to him be glory forever and ever. Amen.
Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. As I mentioned before, the financial needs of this church will continue in, to exist even as our many ministries and services are canceled. The church will still be here when all of this is said and done. And so we still have monthly bills to pay, utilities, mission support, and salaries. We need your help. So what can you do? Pray and continue to obey the Lord through your financial giving. If you're watching online, you can give through the mail by sending a check to the church, or you can give online by going to the church website and clicking the donate button. May God bless your faithfulness to him.